Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. Denise Littlefield is a 51-year-old mother of three. She is a nana, a sister, a friend, and a survivor of domestic violence. Denise first experienced the abuse as a witness to her mother being verbally, mentally, and physically abused by the hands of her stepfather. However, the abuse came to an abrupt end one night when her stepfather was driving drunk and slammed his vehicle into a bridge, killing two people, one of them being Denise's mother. Denise was six years old. Her mother was 29. After this horrific situation, she was adopted by her mother's parents and was raised and taught to be a strong, independent, loving, hardworking woman. In spite of that, in 2004, Denise found herself and her children in a domestic hell she had never thought she would be in, let alone survive. Denise would like to share her story in hopes that it may help someone recognize the signs of domestic abuse, to get help, and to get out of the situation that could very well end their life. There is a trigger warning to the story. There is great detail about sexual and physical violence, kidnapping, and other signs of power and control dynamics that happen in this domestic relationship. Please take care of yourself. If you're listening to this and you're not feeling great emotionally, stop listening. Give yourself a break and get some help. Thank you. Hi, Naomi. Hi, Mandy. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. I'm excited. Today we have Denise with us. Hi, Denise. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to have you. Honor to have you. you. Your story, um, I have been promoting, I don't know if it's the right word, (laughs) but in awe about the story that you're going to tell. So um, I'd like to uh, ask, where would you like your story to start? Um, I guess from the beginning is always the best part, you know, place to start. Um, It's kind of funny when you asked me to write the bio, I was like a little overwhelmed. I've never had to write about myself. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was the first time that I realized that my mother was in a domestic abusive relationship. Um, And it finally clicked with me when I had to sit down and think about my life story. Um, Yeah, my stepfather was drunk and driving and slammed into a bridge at 70 miles an hour, killing her and another person in the car. Oh, my goodness. Um, oh, but he was very verbally, um, mentally, physically abusive to her. Um, and then how, unfortunately, are my only memories of her, are, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of stuff going on. Um, then I was raised by my grandparents, and I was taught to be independent and strong, a hard worker, and never thought in a million years that I would ever be in a situation like my mother was in. Um, But after marrying my high school sweetheart, um, we had three beautiful children. Um, I guess we grew apart after 10 years, we got divorced. And then in 2003, I met Derek. Um, It was a very fast-moving relationship. We were married within eight months of meeting each other. Um, We met through his mother. I worked with her, and that's how I met him. Um, And it all started with um, picking out what I could wear and um, where I should go and be, he had to bring me to work every day and, and pick me up. And then it was not only bringing me to work, but um, he quit his job. And I just came home from work one day, all his tools were in the truck, and he had quit after working somewhere for 10 years as a diesel mechanic, making really decent money for this area in rural Maine. <laughs> and um, 
I was just blown away. And then it was bringing me to work and then coming up on my lunch hour. And I had to sit in the truck with him during my lunch. Um, Then it just gradually got worse. He moved us to Bingham, excuse me, which is about an hour from where my whole family was, where I was raised and um, lived and worked and my children went to school. Um, And that's where the real fun began. (laughs) When mm-hmm. we moved up there, yeah. Then it's what real year was true that? Can I ask? What that year was, was that? Um, that was like later, the end of two thousand three. Okay. Um, we were married in March. We moved to Bingham in October, and was almost immediately like that day, like something snapped, and it was he was drinking, and just very nasty and mean and like he would rip the phone off the wall that was the first thing he would do and that would cut off all my contact I couldn't call for help um not once did I ever call for help I never called the police on him ever not once Mm -hmm. because I knew what would happen if I did if you did so you guys Married in March of 2003. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He moved you away six months later. Yep. Yep. And when you moved away, what resources were around this home that you had? How far away? We're in in Bingham, which is the woods. It's northern Maine. Um, There's one store in the town. Um, There was the health center, which is where I ended up getting a job. And there was a liquor store on Main Street, and that was about it. Um, had it he lived the there woods. before? He had grew he lived up there, there. Yeah, oh, wow. and so it was, he knew people. Yeah, we lived on Miller Drive. That was his last name. That was his family. Oh. Yeah, his. <laughs> yeah, it was right where he grew up. Yes. Yeah. And um, his family was still there. His brother lived right next door to us. Yep. And I'm sure that, he, he heard a lot of stuff go on that he just ignored. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. It's kind of where I'm going. I'm wondering if the town yeah. itself was familiar with his family uh, and oh, him. Yeah. And if you had, if anybody mm-hmm. would have believed you if you did say anything. Yeah, his father was known. He had passed away a couple of years, <clears throat> excuse me, before I met him. And he had passed away. And not till after everything happened and I got away safely um, did I learn about the abuse that his mother had endured for 30 plus years um, by the hands of his father? So Derek was raised knowing that women are beneath you. They don't have an opinion. They shouldn't have an opinion. They should just cook and shut up and sit down and do whatever you want. You have sex when they want and you just mm-hmm. obey them. And that's how women should be. And if not, then you just smack them around and make them act the way you want them to act. Denise, describe your first marriage. Was it similar to this? Are they complete opposite? (laughs) Excuse my one. No, No. say it. Say it. No, (laughs) hell no. Hell no. (laughs) No, my first husband is and was a um, just a very meek. Um, soft-spoken, never called me a mean name the whole time we were married. And and I'm sure I was a bitch once in a while. Mm -hmm. But I never got called it, you know. I Mm -hmm. um, was a hard worker, dairy farmer, worked seven days a week, um, a provider. And um, he's a good man. (laughs) I'm I'm happy that you, you know, had that love. He did. When you think about when you think about what drew you to Derek after your separation with your first husband, it, if you can help other women on that transition, yeah, and what you, was, what attracted you to him? Um, he was six years younger than me, and um, he portrayed himself as such. He was a hard worker. He was a diesel mechanic. He worked hard. Um, he had a home. 
you know, he had a lot, I thought he had a lot going for him. You know, he painted a similar picture. Um, mm. And I, and initially that's what drew me to him. He was nice looking. Um, and I thought, well, you know, he is a lot like Andy. And I, that's what initially attracted to me to him. But um, his colors changed quite quickly. And mm-hmm. I guess I thought I knew what situation I was in, but now how do I get out of it? You know, how do I get out of here without, because the the hitting and the slapping and punching, he would only hit me on places that you couldn't see, like my arms, my legs, you know, so the bruises would be covered. Mm. And then it was um, not letting me sleep at night, putting a gun to my head, making me sleep with the lights on, um, just terrorizing me, <laughs> terrorizing. Denise, when you, you had said at the beginning um, of your podcast that you, you never thought you'd be here. No, no and never. Do you think that that was part of the decision-making not to leave? because you hadn't wrapped your mind around the fact that you were there? Yeah, that, and I didn't know how to get out safely. Like, I didn't want my brother to come up there and help me leave. I didn't want my kids to get hurt. Like, I just didn't want, because I knew how he was, and I knew if somebody had come up and I started packing to leave, he would have shot him. Mm-hmm. I know he would have. That's a burden to carry, sacrificing yourself so that it was you don't put anybody else in harm's way. It was hard. So when you when you take your story, when did you decide to get out? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to <laughs> go. Like right, because that takes a lot. It, it, it we can we can hear it and see it in your emotions, and yeah, you're still feeling that live right now. Yeah. So. Um, I I want to know was there a situation that happened? There that was. You said, I'm um, done. Okay. Yep. I um I was allowed to get a job at the health center. I was a medical assistant, and um so after I got hired there, the company was called Health Reach. They um they do this orientation when you get hired, and a lady from the Fam- family violence project came and did a presentation and I I knew right then like this is me and I, I need to get out of here I need to get out I need to keep my kids safe but I need to get out and that is what started my plan to leave and then I put a plan in motion I um called my dad and at the time he was 89 years old and it was really hard for me to tell him because nobody knew. Mm-hmm. Were your children grown, or they, were they living with you at the time, or with yeah, their dad? Or? They, um, the two boys were staying at their dad's, but they came up every weekend. But my daughter was 13, and she was living there all the time. Um, mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, and my youngest was 11, and my oldest was 50. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I called my dad and I talked to my brother and told them a little bit about what was going on and that I needed to leave. I was in a bad situation. And so they immediately wanted to come rushing right up, you know. And I told them, no, I need to do this, but I need to get out on my own. I need to get out safely. Mm-hmm. So I started putting stuff down in the basement that weekend, like stuff like my kid's baby books and photo albums and stuff that I knew that I need this stuff, like everything else can go, but because I knew he wouldn't give me back all my stuff. So Mm -hmm. I knew whatever I took in that initial flight was probably what I was going to have. So, and I called my children's father 
and had him come up and get the kids. I just told him I was sick and he needed to come get the kids. Mm-hmm. So I got the kids out and on Monday I went to work and my plan was with my brother was Monday night after I got home from work, I was counting on Derek to be drunk and he was. And after he fell asleep, we had just one vehicle and I didn't want to keep the vehicle, but I needed it for a getaway. So I had during the weekend, I had walked downtown and made an extra key up. So he didn't know I had a key because he controlled the keys. He controlled everything, locked them up in a safe. So I had my extra key and I, I waited for him to go to sleep or pass out, I should say. And I, I went out. It was pouring rain, of course. It had to rain. <laughs> and I got all my stuff out. And then I had to run back in and grab my pillow and this blanket that my grandmother had made me, and I couldn't leave it. I slept with it every night. And um, when I went back in, he was awake. So, yeah, and he's like, what are you doing? I was so... I said, well, the cat got out. I had to go get something out of the truck, and the cat got out. So I've been out there looking for him. Anyways, he ended up passing back out. And at 3 in the morning, when I knew he was asleep, I left him a letter just telling him I couldn't live like that anymore. I left him $60. And I got in that truck, and I just drove like, never so scared in my life. Like, I just white-knuckled that steering wheel till I got to the other town, to Solon. I just, I don't even know how fast I was going. Probably way too fast, but I did. Denise, how long, real quick, how long did it take, you know, as as the listeners are going through your story, when you made, when you saw the pres- the presentation, from the domestic yeah. violence to the point that you were white knuckling in the car. How much mm-hmm. time was that? About 10 days. It was quick. It was real quick. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you're white knuckling it in the car. Um, so I drove the hour I got to my dad's and, um, and my brother came down and as soon as the courts opened, we went right to the straight to the courthouse and I filled out a, protection from abuse um, mm-hmm. form to because I knew I would need one. <laughs> and I dropped the vehicle off at a parking lot and left the keys in it because I told them that I would leave it there. And then, then the stalking started, the harassing. He wanted me to tell the judge that He didn't want to lose his guns. He had a lot of guns. He was a gun collector. He was a hunter. But he liked to put his loaded guns to my head. And Mm -hmm. so I did put that in my report when I went for my my restraining order. And he wanted me to go tell the judge that he really didn't do that because he didn't want to lose his rights to guns. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, that I wasn't going to do that. I I wasn't going to go and lie to a judge and tell them that I lied about something because I didn't lie. Everything I put in there was true. He, he raped me. I mm. mean, everything I put in there was true. Oh, Denise. And, um, so I, I still continue to go to work in Bingham, even though he lived up there. But I had three kids. I needed a job. I've always had at least one job, most of the time two. And I got the um, divorce papers from the courthouse down here in the town where I'm from, and I filled them all out. It was pretty amicable. We didn't have, he was getting his house back and his vehicle, and all I wanted was my my safety and my kid's safety. That's it. I had everything filled out, and he told me one day at when I was at work, he had called me and said, if you meet me at the boat landing on your lunch, I'll sign the divorce papers and we'll be done with this. And I said, okay. 
I figured I'd meet him at a public boat landing. There's people around. It's in August, so there's kids still on vacation. They're swimming. And I got there, and I'm driving my dad's car because I didn't have a vehicle. I gave it to him. <laughs> and um, I got out, and he was sitting on a log. And I walked over, and as soon as I got to him, he pulled out a gun, and he's like, you're coming with me. Mm. And he took me at gunpoint, put me on the floorboard of the truck and drove me to the house. And um, the garage was like attached to the house. So once you go in and shut that garage door, automatic door, you can't see anybody. They go in the house. You don't even see them. So that's what he did. And he took me on my lunch break. He um, made me take all my clothes off and, held me in the house for four hours. He raped me, um, made me take a bath and a shower. And he bagged all that stuff up in a plastic black bag, garbage bag. And he took me back to my car and I drove home. Oh, my God. Denise, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I was thinking, I'm never going to get this man out of my life, ever. That's what I was just thinking. I mean, just thinking about that, like, this is going to be my life forever. Yet, what am I going to do? How do I do this? You know, just the the obsession to show you his power control and yeah. power, and that's what it was. Oh. Yeah, I'm still in control. Yeah. I didn't say anything to anybody. I went to. What was your next. thought in that moment? Not to do that. What? I didn't know what he would do next. So he even took away your resources that you had that got you out. He knew that yep. this was going to paralyze your yep. progression into leaving him. Yep. So once again, he extracted you from anything that was going to help you. He won that he, fight again. Yep. I did. He, I had an appointment with my counselor. I was seeing a, a counselor that, one of the doctors that I worked with at the health center, she, she had, she was helping me. I told her what I was planning to do to leave him, and because she saw bruises on my neck, and she knew something was up. And she had asked me that Monday that I was planning to leave if I was safe, and I just broke down. I said, "No, I'm not." <laughs> And she set me up with a lady. And then after he did that, that day, I canceled my appointment. I didn't want to see her. I guess I just, I think I knew that she would know something had happened. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to hide it. I was trying to cover up for him again, you know. Mm -hmm. Even though I was out, I was still just not wanting people to know. It's a shameful thing. So after the four hours, where did he drop you off? He took me right back to my car, right back to the boat landing. He dropped me off and I drove home. And the next day I went to work. And as soon as Cindy, the doctor, saw me, she knew something was wrong and took me in the office. And and then I told her, I told her what he did. And, She's like, we knew something was wrong when you called yesterday and said that you weren't coming back to work, that your dad wasn't feeling good and you were going home. She's like, we were afraid for you. And so then she called the lady the counselor and she came up to the clinic and we went together to the sheriff's department to report it. And... 
that was another shit show in, the, uh, in its own like they couldn't find my restraining order they it was it was horrible did he they did, when you were there in the police department did you get the support you needed not at all not at all no nope. Would you go into what you expected and what you got at that time? No, not at all. No. They, um, saying, you know, at first, you know, they, they took my report. They listened to me. They found the restraining order. And then they, a detective took me out in his truck and he had me call Derek because he wanted Derek to admit it. You know, and he was listening in on the phone. And because Derek's not going to admit it. And um, they went to his house and he wouldn't come to the door. Um, so they weren't arresting him. They were just, and then he left his house and went to his brother's and they kept saying, well, we can't find him. This was like two weeks of, I was going to the sheriff's department almost every day saying, why isn't he in jail? Why haven't you arrested him? Well, we can't find him. And I'm telling you where he is. He's right, he's in, at his brother's house. Like, right, I'm telling you. Do you want me to walk you, you there? where he is. I, I said right. that. I will drive there with you if you want me to. Mm-hmm. Nope. And then it took, my oldest son played football, and Derek was calling me on a base on every day. The numerous times they had a recorder hooked to my phone and I'd tape record because that's what their sheriff's department told me to do. I'd tape record Which, the by calls. the way, I would think your restraining order wouldn't allow him to call you, right? Exactly. Just him but they calling said, me loud- should have landed his ass in jail. Period. Right. I'm sitting there thinking, they're right? saying record it, but they mm-hmm. should have been like, you're – Let's go get him. I'm assuming they can ping where he's calling from or a landline. Like that should have triggered him to go to jail right then. Yep. Okay, I'm done crying. Now I'm pissed. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And that's where I was going at this point. I'm I'm getting pissed at this point. I mean, Uh, just saying, saying, oh, he doesn't have a prior criminal record. He's never been in trouble before. And like, I'm sorry, he raped you. It doesn't exactly. matter if there's a prior record. Like he you put a gun me. to your head and held mm-hmm. you captive. Exactly. And that's not enough. I weren't for the Somerset Sheriff's Department. But wow. I lived in Kennebec County then, because I was at my dad's and it was a Friday night and my son was getting ready to play football. He had a game that night. And Derek threatened his life that he was gonna do something to my son at the game. So and I said that was it. My dad's like, call Canada County. He's like, I'm done with Somerset. You call them or call the state police. we this is enough. So I did. I called Canada County and a sheriff deputy came right to the house. They sent two deputies to the football field, sat with my son. They sat right on the bench and so my son could play. And within an hour and a half he had him arrested. He went to where I told him he would be at his brother's. He knocked the door and Derek answered it. It was that cut and dry. And he had him in jail within two hours that Somerset County dicked around for two weeks. They just didn't take me serious. The assistant DA didn't take me serious. Told me I was overreacting. Um, I needed to calm down. I was overreacting. I didn't need to be coming to the sheriff's department every day. So then they arrested I'm sorry, sir. Let's have you get Mm -hmm. kidnapped and raped. And then you tell me that Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be an advocate for myself. Exactly. And my kids. Because you're definitely not here for me. No, none of them were. None of them were. But I didn't know anything about the judicial system. That was so, it was like a foreign language to me. I didn't know anything about the process, anything. So I was numb to the process, but I knew that they weren't doing their job. They weren't doing their job. They weren't trying to protect me or my kids or get him in jail. Nothing. They just well, didn't. It doesn't take a doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that the next step mm-hmm. is, you know, potentially to kill you. <laughs> exactly. So, so they isn't arrested that their, him. Their job. They arrested him. 
and he was arrested down on the coast. So he was in a different jail for the weekend, and then they brought him right to Somerset County on Monday. By Friday, the judge lowered his bail by 80% and let him out on $10,000 charity. Somebody put their house up. And, and he walked out of that jail, and I was sitting in the detective's office downstairs when he got the call to tell, tell him that Derek had made bail. And I just, I'm like, I'm a dead woman. You know that, right? I'm dead. I'm going to die. He's going to kill me. No, he's not. He's out on bail restrictions and this and that. He's, he's not going to do that. He's, you're going to be fine. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm dead. He's going to kill me. I just know he is. And then 10 days later, I drove to work and put my car in park. My door flew open and a gun to my head. And he just literally picked me up. He had stole his brother's van and threw me in the van. And we went Real into quick, the woods. Denise, where did he get guns from? His um, brother. I, okay, so yep. they confiscated all his guns. Yep. But allowed him to go to, to his brother's out. house. Who had his brother yep. bailed him out? Um, his um, a friend of his mother's put his house up, which he didn't lose either because he lived in it. So they can't take it if you live in it. So what? How good was that, right? Anyway, yeah, they let him go to his brother's. He was. Um, Does his brother just have one gun? Army National Guard, no. He had gun cabinets. Gun cabinets. So it's obvious that this person had a lot of guns where he was staying. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's not like the police would say, look, we didn't think this guy had any. You're like, it's obvious he he had a lot of guns. He's a guard at the main state prison. His brother is a guard at the main state prison. Um, And he's a National Arms Guardsman. Like, yeah, he has gun cabinets full of guns, knives. Um, so he came so another prepared. fail on the Somerset Police Department. Oh obviously. yeah, big time, big mm-hmm. time. He came prepared. He was dressed in army fatigues, um, handguns, enough ammo. When he dragged to, you out of the car, he was yeah. dressed in army fatigue. Oh yeah, the combat boots and everything. Yep, he had shaved his head, his beard, and mustache. Which, like, I didn't. I've never seen him shaven like that. Yeah. So he was ready. Stole his or- brother-in-law. He stole his sister-in-law's van, minivan. So, because I didn't recognize him, he followed me from Skowhegan all the way to Bingham. So he followed me for a half hour, and I didn't even realize he was behind me. <laughs> yep. So there was my car, left running, radio on, all my stuff, my coffee, my bag, door wide open. And one of the girls that I work with, had gotten there that day before me, which I always unlocked first. I was like always the first one there. And she saw him out the window. She was making coffee in the break room, and she saw him throw me in the van. And she called. And when Somerset Sheriff's Department was the first ones on the scene. Lucky for you. (laughs) And when Dr. Robinson got there, you know, everybody starts showing up for work, and there's my car, and Naomi's freaking out because she saw what happened. And the cops are just nonchalantly, and then they start at Dr. Robertson about you writing out prescription drugs for people that she shouldn't. And she saw it. she's like in the woods looking for me, and they're hollering and telling her that, she needs to mind her own business and get back in the clinic. And, oh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a terrible situation. Um, she called the state police. So instead of looking for you. Yep. They started in with Dr. Robinson about the practice that she ran and writing prescription drugs for people. And she's like, I have a colleague that's out there. God knows what's happening to her right now. And this is what you're going to do? Yeah. She called the state police. And then it all started. Then it was game on there. They took over. And 
Yeah, so we were in so the tell, woods. Okay, that's where I was going to go. What happened? So go ahead. Yeah. He um he drove up the ridge up to the woods in Bingham. And I'm, this is thick woods. Like you can't, you have to go like this to like get through the thickets, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he drove the van down into the woods and ran it into a tree. So he totaled that out. And he raped me in the van. And then we left the van. But I used to watch these crime shows. <laughs> so I'm in my nursing scrubs, you know, short sleeves and nursing clogs. And so I took my socks off and I like left them by the van, but they were kind of like in the woods because we were like, he was walking me then. I was like leaving them a trail. I thought if I left I was going to say, you were, you were just raped and you had the wits about you yeah, to say, okay. It, yeah, now scent I, I dogs. Have, yeah, yes. they pick up your scent from your socks, mm-hmm. from socks or whatever. So I did. I left my socks there. Um, and then we started through you. the woods. And yeah, he had a scanner. So I was listening to everything. So you can hear when the police went, looking for you? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. When they were at the school, get my kids. And oh. When they went to my dad's house. Now, yeah. when you, when, did, did, did at this point, did you realize it, with the, it was the state police or did you think it was still Somerset? No, I knew it was the state police then. So, because yeah, they went. There was a little bit more confidence that. At least there yeah. was somebody who cared enough. I started hearing helicopters and planes. Um, mm. And then a few hours, I started hearing dogs barking. Because um, it was 7.30 in the morning when he kidnapped me. Mm-hmm. But it, and then it started to get dark. I ended up breaking the scanner. Um because I just, I couldn't hear that anymore. Like, I just couldn't hear it. How did you break it? I just took it by the antenna and smacked it up against a tree. Mm. How did he react to that? How did he react to that? Oh, he hit me and threw me to the ground and kicked me a couple times. So it was worth it to you at that time? It was, yeah. You knew it? Yeah. I think... I don't know. I was, it was just a weird, like he would go through spells of, as it started to get dark, he's scared of the dark. And he's petrified of dogs, petrified of dogs. And he'd have moments of weakness where he'd be like, what did I do? I've messed my whole life up. You know, what am I doing? And, um, kind of took advantage of it because I'd tell him, you know, when these dogs get all of you, dude, you're, you know, that's going to hurt. That sounds like a lot of them. Like, that's going to hurt. I'm like, you know. That's brave to do that. Like. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you think about the, how strategic that. you were in leaving your socks yeah. and breaking the scanner, knowing he wouldn't have communication, taking advantage of his vulnerable yeah. moments and making him scared. Like the flash you're bad too. ass. Like you were really in the moment trying to save your life. I was. It's a scary the flashlight, I got rid of that. We lost it is what he thinks we lost it. Cause he had like a backpack, but no food, no drinks, no water. He smoked like three packs of cigarettes. He didn't have cigarettes, but he had weapons, knives, you know, he had all that stuff. The scanner and flashlights. Oh, I got rid of the flashlight too. And so when it got dark, I knew that he would be petrified. And I would be better off with him scared. You know what I mean? Than than angry and having his light (laughs) being able to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was so like if he didn't co- bring food, if he didn't bring water, he wasn't planning on either 
kidnapping you for long or being alive for long. That's what I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know. I couldn't figure that in my head. You know what I mean? Like if he was going to kill me, wouldn't he have done it by now? Now what's Mm -hmm. he waiting for? Um, I certainly didn't think he planned on coming out. Not alive anyway. So how did the evening go? Um, Obviously like sleeping. It started to get dark. Um, I didn't sleep. (laughs) I was up against a tree and um, he had given me a sweatshirt out of the truck, out of the van when we left because he had ripped my scrub top almost off of me. So that was in the van too, ripped in half. And he gave me a sweatshirt of his to wear. And I had my arms out of my sleeve and I had pulled it down over my legs and was just like hugging my body, you know, just trying to mm-hmm. stay warm up against a tree. What month was this in Maine? It was September 24th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was cold. It was like 36 that night. Oh. Mm. Yeah, it was cold. I've never been so cold in my life. <laughs> um, but through the night, I had talked to him, and I had him convinced that he was going to surrender. He was going to give up in the morning. I'm like, I'm sure once we get to a logging road, there's going to be law enforcement there. Um, the game wardens are probably out here by now. You know, so when you see him, I'm like, just put your hands in the air. And I'll tell them that, you know, you did give up and whatever. Well, (laughs) Somerset County came through again because when we got out to a logging road, there wasn't a goddamn person in sight. Mm. Nobody. 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 And we walked out as soon as the sun came up. I was just waiting for that. You know, I never prayed so hard for that sun to come up, you know, for the daylight so we could see to get out of here because we were in thickets. That's why he took me in there because I couldn't run out. Yeah, I, You know what I mean? You have to go Yeah, well you had to be your it. own hostage negotiator to find out yeah. when you finally got him to give up, there was nobody there to take him. Nobody there. <sighs> and then it was, it's like a mountain. Um, Pleasant Ridge is a mountain. And we walked all day that day. I walked, I was dragged, I was pushed down. Every time a plane ran, came over, a helicopter flew over, he threw me to the ground. Because um, then you weren't giving up then. Not, not once he got out there and see, there was nobody around. Right, now he's game, like... The, game yeah. on still. Yep, yeah. here we go, day two. Yep. And... Um, but he got us closer down to the roadway. And where we was we're still in the woods, we was we ended up at the end of the day out behind his sister in law's grandparents' house, a couple in their eighties. And he knows these people. He's known these people his whole life. They've known him his whole life. And we're in their backyard, but it's wooded, you know, they can't see us. I can see cop cars going by. I can hear the planes, the dogs, but nobody's seeing me. Like, So you would think they would have these familiar places staked out. Yeah. You would have That's think, what I right? Was thinking. Mm-hmm. You're, you're probably thinking, this is great. Yeah. He's going somewhere where the cops are obviously going to know. They're going to be looking. He might be taking. Yes. Right. They're going to be there probably, right? No. Especially since they knew he went up the ridge. They had witnesses that saw him driving up the ridge. So they knew we were up the ridge. They found the van. His brother was helping find us, and he's the one that found the van in a hunting spot, one of the tote roads that they used to hunt. Um, So they knew we were in that area. And no, they did not. And it started to get dark again. Mm -hmm. And I, I was exhausted at this point. Um, We had nothing to drink or eat um, well over 24. It was like 35 hours at this time. And um, I had dozed off. I was sleeping, but I I had a dream of my dad. And he just said, get up and go. 
just get up and come home. And I just got up. I stood up and I said, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm leaving now. I'm not staying here until night. He's like, no, you're not. You're not going anywhere. And I said, yes, I am, Derek. I'm not. It's either by body bag or by foot. But my ass is out of the woods. I'm leaving right now. And I just started walking towards that house. Like, legs of jelly when I was walking. I wasn't going to stop. And I walked right out onto their back lawn. And the old man come out because Derek's right behind me. And he's like, Derek. Give me the gun. Where's the gun? Give me your gun. He handed him the gun. And... Oh. I'm like, I want, you need to call the cops. You need to call somebody and tell them I'm here. <laughs> they called his family. Oh, oh my God. Sorry. No, no please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they all came up. That was horrible, horrifying. Oh. Oh. So and once again, sister- he's in total control. Yeah, his sister in law came over. I was sitting on the lawn out back up against the house. I just by myself. And she came over. She's like, come on. She's like, come on, I'm gonna take you downtown to the station. She's like, come on, I'm gonna take you. You're gonna be all right. So she put me in the truck. And, and this was his brother's wife? Yeah. The one that did, he stole the van from and Do you feel like yeah. she was a uh supporting you because yeah. she knew and believed you and she yeah. was putting herself at risk at the time supporting you? She was, yeah, she was devastated. She kept saying, I, we would have never bailed him out if we knew he was going to do this. We would have never got him out of jail. Like, yep. And you're probably like, I tried to warn you guys. Like, But we was driving down the ridge and his mother and her husband were coming up. And so Melanie stops to talk to her. And she's like me saying, I, this was my fault. <laughs> Derek's mom? Yep. Oh, honey. Yep. Yeah. Telling me she wished that nothing but bad will from me and my family. Oh. Yeah. And this is a woman who had been abused her whole life? Yeah. Wow. Yep. She had been. Yeah, shot at her. Her Derek's father shot at her with a shotgun one day. She was running down the driveway, and he shot at her with a shotgun. You could have killed her. He doesn't. He didn't care. He was a sick man, and I think mm-hmm. Derek is sick as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But when they were looking for me in the woods, um, they found that big black garbage bag that I had told you about the first time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they found out. So they knew I hadn't been lying all along. Mm-hmm. I was telling the truth. So then they she got me down to the fire station and that's where like all the game ones and state troopers were and, and then somebody opened the door. I just tried to step out I just collapsed I, just, I was like I'm finally free mm-hmm. they put me in an ambulance and brought me to well they waited until they had him they didn't even know it, that he had come out of the woods until Melanie brought me into the fire station they thought we were still out there they didn't know and Melanie mm-hmm. said, follow me, I'll take you to him. Which means they didn't even have the family member's phones tapped. They weren't <laughs> listening, nor did they care to know the conversations happening with loved ones mm-hmm. that you know he would have tried to you contact. You think they would have been following them. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. There'd have been a trooper right at their house or something, right? They were all staying at one of the brothers' house right in Bingham. So you would have thought, you would have thought, you would have thought they'd have done a lot of things, but they didn't. Mm. Yeah. So they arrest him. They arrested him, and um, I was taken to the hospital. And um, I was in the hospital just overnight, and then they let me go home the next day. I, yeah, my whole family was there. I was over 100 people at the hospital. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was quite the thing, yeah. I bet you that felt at least relief for you to know. Yeah. Support, that you had that support. My brother physically attacked Lieutenant Guattardi, one of the sheriffs from Somerset. Oh, I bet. <laughs> I came bet. To the, he came to the hospital and... My brother's like, oh, hell no. Like, you're a little too late. <laughs> you need to leave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, you, you, you start you, hearing your story and it feels like Groundhog's Day, right? So he's arrested again. <laughs> yeah. In your mind, did you even think anything was going to go right? Or did you think he was um, getting out? Or At, at this point, um, my, one of my aunts worked for the DA's office in Augusta which is our state's capital. And so he's the DA for the Kennebec and Somerset County. He's the big cheese. And um, she is his paralegal. So at that time, no, because it was in the state's hands and it was out of Somerset County's hands. So then I did feel safe. Yeah. Everett gave him bail, $5 million bail. Yeah. Good. It was his bail. He's like, and if, if by some miracle he even come close to even trying to make that, he's like, oh, we'll just go with no deal. No, Everett, Everett, um, he took care of me after that. Once the state police and the state got involved, I had a victim's advocate, and then things went better. Yeah. So fast forward, he's convicted in yeah, jail for how um, long? Like, where is he at now? He pled guilty. Um, we were two days from picking out jury trial, and he ended up pleading out. He got 14 years, all but seven suspended. Um, he had served a year, so he only had six to serve. He went to the main state prison. He was there two months, and they evicted him and sent him to New Jersey State Prison to Riverview because he wasn't, um, he was just horrible, horrible to deal with. And, um, he wasn't taking any of the sexual abuser fender classes, um, refused to take them and other things that he was supposed to. So they sent him there. He ended up spending nine years down there. Um, and he was released in 2013. 12, How scary 2012, was that? August How scary 2012. was that for you when you I found out? I was petrified. I was petrified. Mm-hmm. I weighed 98 pounds the day he got out of jail. Ugh. Yep. I was terrified. Terrified. How have the last eight years been with him being out? Quiet. Knock on wood. I don't know where I can see. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, not a phone call or nothing. Yep. Yeah. But we he's have, um, still in the area. I, mean, I was going to say, we have, uh, have you run into each other at the grocery no, store? Have never. you ran into a woman that's dating him no. who has anything? Okay. No. Mm-mm. I don't think he lives in the, I think he's still in the Bingham area living, but he works in Fairfield, which is where I live. Or I was living till I moved to Waterville, which they're like joining towns. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I drive by where he works. I'll, not if I don't have to, I don't, but I do. I drove by yesterday, as a matter of fact. Well, I have to tell you, you, um, you know, when we first met you and you were telling us that the the voice that you have is for other women, mm-hmm. uh, you're, you're so brave to tell your story. And you told it with such detail 
that it was hard for me to listen to. Mm-hmm. Like I, we have a tissue bar. Like just, I know I went through a whole thing of tissues. <laughs> you, you are so brave, so yeah. brave. And the compassion you have for other women yeah. in your situation. So if you could take some time, what would you tell other women going through this, who are listening to this mm-hmm. right now, who can tell just like you in that presentation, Yeah, they know this is them. What advice do you give them? Go to somebody that you can trust, anybody, a family member, um, a law enforcement. Things have changed a lot since when I went through this, the domestic violence and stuff that you can't be bailed out and let into a house where there is guns. So there are other laws in place, um, but definitely tell somebody, talk to somebody. There's help. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. How would you, what advice would you give them if they've told somebody now they know that they have a confidant and they're afraid of the violence that will happen to them or the people they love when they make the exit? Yeah, that's tough. It's so hard because everybody's circumstances are different too. Um, get, get What I was told to was keep a paper trail. Um Get your, get your um, FAPs, whatever they are, family violence protection orders. Get them in place. Um, and I don't know, there's a family violence project. They're really good. Um, and there's other outlets out there, too. There's women's shelters that you can go to, and you can be strictly anonymous um, for your kids, too. There's a women's shelter in Solon now. So... Yeah. And for anybody listening in the show notes, we will have uh, the National Domestic Violence Hotline yeah. uh, listed for you, and they will help you with any local resources for this. Um, and then we also have one of our other podcast guests, uh, Jennifer Walker, on her podcast. She talked yeah. about domestic violence and had some really good resources for you she as well. Did. So we'll really put that in them. the in the show notes. Yeah. I enjoyed her podcast a lot. I listened to that one. Yeah. It's interesting because when you were going through your story, a lot of the warning signs that she had pointed out are exactly what you went through. And that was my question for somebody who's new into a relationship. Recognize the warning signs. Yeah. Yeah. What warning signs would you say Um, are red flags? You know, somebody telling you where to go, who you can be friends with, what you can wear, um, what classes to take in high school. I mean, it can start at a young age. It can definitely start in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, just recognize those signs. And the, I had a little voice in my head saying, to say it right, like some, you know, early on, slow down. This is going too fast. This isn't right. Listen to that voice. Mm-hmm. Definitely right. It's that intuition, that. right? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's that part of you that yes. you don't, you, to your point earlier in the podcast, you never thought this could be you. No, never. Not in a million years. And people so that- So why would you even up, listen to yourself? Right. I know. Yep. Yeah. So it's, don't, the, really the advice is too, is don't think it couldn't be you. No, it can happen to anybody. Mm-hmm. What I was reading the statistics- 4.1 million people a year are victims of domestic violence. I actually I just recently heard Men a story too. about yeah. a man who is in yeah. a situation. Mm-hmm. So My it's ex-husband not is yeah. he's in a mentally abusive relationship and it's sad. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think that goes to tell you that they the abusers know what to tap into. Oh yeah. And they're good at it. Very good at it. Mm -hmm. And it's not the first rodeo, right? Right. You're not the first woman he's done this to. Right. Right. He was too experienced in what he was doing. Just a master manipulator. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And most of them are narcissistic too, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm honored that you told your story. Obviously it's Uh, very difficult for you. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm honored that you guys had me. I 
I hope that if anybody out there is listening and you're in a situation like this, just get out. <laughs> Do whatever you can to get out. I want to give you such the biggest hug for you because I I do believe I do I do I I do believe your story is is so familiar for people yeah and um I I want I want you to know that I've been impacted by your story oh thank you and you are so genuine (laughs) thank you and your ability to tell your story yeah. is phenomenal. Well, you did a you. fantastic job. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. And tell your daughter, thank you for helping us in the beginning oh, of the I podcast. Will. She's amazing. <laughs> she is. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye-bye. Too.